you so much. They tried to convince me to put one of those mouthpieces in, it just didn't fit. Yeah, it didn't work out. Um, I am so happy to be here with you this evening. I, I was thinking, having been at this huge conference, uh, I went to a symposium for religious sisters last year, actually, and there were like 500 sisters from about 60 different religious communities. So uh, it was a nun convention. I mean, that's what it was. <laughs> and the topic was being a prophetic witness to the world. Now, at the same hotel, there were two other conventions going on simultaneously. A cheerleader convention <laughs> and a tattoo artist convention. No, no joke, you can't make this stuff up. So I'm going through the breakfast buffet and it's like pom-poms and pigtails and skulls and dragons and the whole tilma of Our Lady of Guadalupe and every rose that fell from that tilma. And I thought, they're witnessing to me, you know, the cheerleaders, the desire of the human heart for encouragement, to be cheered on, winning, losing. I'm on your team, I'm with you. The tattoos. I saw a desire for permanence, commitment, Memory, dates, names, faces. <laughs> I also saw the desire of the human heart for self-expression through creativity. <laughs> now, the symposium ended and we were taking a late night flight back to New York and we get to the airport and they overbooked. So they're like, sisters, would you take these vouchers, meal tickets, hotel, we'll get you out on the first flight tomorrow morning if you'll accept. And in a spirit of poverty, we totally cashed in. <laughs> so we go back to the hotel, right? And it was like scene change. Two new conventions are starting. The Star Wars convention. <laughs> and a body art exhibition. This wasn't a dream I had, okay? You know, and, and then my third grade teacher was there and got weird. No. So I was like, okay, what's being witnessed to me now? Star Wars. There is an intergalactic battle for souls. The force and the dark side. Yes. There is a longing to know your father. <laughs> all I know, all I know is somebody handed me a balloon lightsaber and I was so happy. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, for the body artists, so we were trying to get through a hallway and two of them were trying to pass us. Uh, one, the artist, uh, a small girl, uh, head down, eyes averted from us, cute, hot pink pixie haircut, and her, her work of art, a, a woman painted from head to toe and wearing a robe. So they're ducking past us and my sister goes, incredible. To which they both exhaled, oh. oh, I thought you'd be mad at us. Want to see the starry night on her back? There it was. <laughs> and I couldn't help but think and say, I just wish it were on a canvas. <laughs> and this girl said to me, I don't. Beauty is fleeting and nothing lasts. For a time it moves, it's alive. And then it just all gets washed down the drain and no one sees it again. What was being witnessed to me? Yes, beauty is fleeting and life is fragile, that's true. But if we look deep within, if we're honest, I have a desire for an infinite beauty that does not pass away. I long for a love that is forever and mine. This has everything to do with our origin and with our destiny, God. Only an infinite one can satiate my thirst for an infinite, forever stable love. And it's the very one who gave it to me. 
thought we could start with a prayer just to open our hearts to the Spirit. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Come, you are welcome here. Show us the Father. Let us receive the gaze of Jesus upon us. Let us see ourselves as we truly are. Help us to receive and hear all that you desire for us this night. Be with us, Blessed Mother. Be a mother to us. Amen. So tonight, we see the gift of God, and in this Christmas season, we see that he came to us wrapped in swaddling bands and lying in a manger, giving himself to us, walking among us tonight. Part of gift giving is receiving. It's essential, actually. So gifts can be received, they can be rejected, they can be left unwrapped and forgotten. Jesus says, ask and you shall receive. This receiving is the gift that we give. Tonight I want to talk about receiving the gifts of God. The ones that he's giving to us and has given to us. First, receive the gift of life. Second, receive the gift of the new heart. Third, receive the gift of the kingdom. So first, receive the gift of life. God saw all that he had made and saw that it was very good. The same God who set the bounds of the ocean and who placed the stars in their courses, who had a thought and it became Niagara Falls, snowflakes, the orangutan, giraffe, you know? I mean, the peacock. That bird has a 10-foot train of technicolor feathers. And if it wants to get your attention, it's like, well, bam <laughs> I mean, it, all of creation is like oozing beauty, creativity, sound, texture, smell, all of it. It's incredible to think that with all of this intricate creativity, this God made you. And with more care and more purpose, I love to think about fingerprints. Fingerprints identify you as the only you who ever was and ever will be. No two sets are the same. If God is gonna take so much care in arranging and designing the circle pattern on the end of your finger, how much more the love in your heart? Your love is totally unique to you. You are the only one who can love with the love of your heart. And you're the only one who can love God with the love of your heart. And you're the only one who can receive his love into this space, which is you. And he longs for this. No one else can satiate his desire for you. In St. Paul's letter to the Galatians, he says, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. So you are no longer slaves. You are a child. And if a child, then an heir. You know when your favorite song comes on and you just have to hear like that first guitar strum or like the piano interlude and you're like, oh gosh. <laughs> it's my song. Like, you have this kind of, like, un unstated knowing that when God inspired the artist to write it, he actually had you in mind. And you'll be mid-conversation with someone, and it'll come on, and you're like, oh, could you hold that thought? It's my song. <laughs> and you, you just want to excuse yourself. You almost feel like you have to be on your bed in the dark, like, just to, like, drink it in. And you just bless the inventor of the repeat button. It's the song that when you're in the car, you're like, windows down, volume up, praise hand out. <laughs> yes, my song. You know. I'm going to sing you mine, and it's a little awkward to do it without a guitar. But um, I thrive in awkwardness, and I don't play the guitar. So, 
I was thinking maybe you just wouldn't look at me right now or the jumbotrons. <clears throat> You're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are. And I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. And it just takes off at that point, you know? Yeah, that's so good. He's a good father. He's a good father. Thank you for all those with sympathy, anxiety who joined me. Um, the father is seeking you and he knows that you're made for communion because you're in his image and likeness. The catechism reminds us that no one is father as God is father. And we have a good father. He loves you and he is always present. He is never too busy, distracted, burdened by your needs, your desires, your questions. He's affectionate. Jesus tells us that he has kisses and hugs for a son who's been with the pigs. This father is ours. He never withholds from us. He's a good provider. So how do we receive this gift that is ours? Because often we live like orphans. There's something called an orphan spirit and it can attach itself to me. And I can begin living out of this belief that I'm a burden, alone. I've been rejected. I'm on the outside. I'm not someone who's been chosen. I'm not beloved. I have to work to earn love and to prove that I'm worthy of it, somehow acceptable. I need to establish my own ident identity because I didn't receive one from the Father. And I'm always striving to be better. And I know even in the striving, it's not good enough. We need to seek deliverance and healing from this orphan spirit. Jesus said, I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. A priest living in San Francisco shared this story with us. He received a panicked phone call. There was a young girl on top of the Golden Gate Bridge. Would he come and assist? Now, this priest was a very short man and terrified of heights. So he drives out and he arrives on the scene and they point her out to him. He said, nothing can get her down. So petrified, he puts his hand on the cables and he starts to make his way up. Now, it was a windy day, so the bridge is kind of swaying. The man's like trembling like a leaf and totally drenched in sweat, sopping, completely sopping. And he's, he's trying not to look down, but he doesn't want to look up, so he's just trying to keep himself together. And this girl looks down and she sees someone, obviously panicking, and she calls down, hey, you're almost there. <laughs> you're gonna make it. He's like, oh God, help me. Oh my God, I'm heartily sorry. He's inching his way up, and she sees he has a Roman collar on. He finally makes it to the top, to her little perch, and she pulls him over. And he sits next to her, and he just starts rocking himself. <laughs> and her heart is so moved. He does not even know me. He thinks I'm worth it. Finally, Father's able to speak, and he says, how am I gonna get down? <laughs> She's like, I'll help you. Here, put your hand here. Yeah, put your leg, you know, I'll go first. Yeah, she, she gets down. Okay, step, step, left, yes, yes. Oh, easy, uh-huh, nice and easy. Yeah, you're okay. I'm here with you, step by step. 
by step. They get to the bottom, everyone's safe and sound, and everyone's like, Father, what did you say? <laughs> His whole life flashed before his eyes. He goes, she saved my life. <laughs> Jesus comes to the place where you are and he says, you are not an orphan, you have a father and he sent me. I give you my mother as your mother. You have a home and a family, the church. You are accepted. Just wanna take a moment right now and just let the gift of your life wash over your heart. Receive the gift of your life from him. Receive the gift of a new heart. When the angels fell, the father did not send his son to become an angel. But when our first parents fell and sinned, God could not bear to be separated from us and sent his son as a man to redeem us. The father said everything to us in this one word, Jesus. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. The very places that you experience the deepest inadequacy, insecurity, confusion, the pain of abuse suffered, rejection, he comes to that place and he draws you out. The gift of God is for you. It's yours. He wants you to see the way that he looks at you. The promise given by the Lord to the prophet Ezekiel is given to you tonight. I will sprinkle clean water upon you to cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols, I will cleanse you. I will give you a new heart and place a new spirit within you that you may live. I want you to take a second right now and just think to yourself, what impurity is my heart longing to be cleansed from? Am I ready to allow myself to be given the gift of a new heart, a new beginning? Now there are a few things that keep us from this sweet, repentance that turns our life around and back to God. And we need to be able to call these things by their proper name. When I entered the convent, uh, one of my classmates was from New Zealand, and she picked up the fact that Americans call things by their brand name and not by what they actually are. So, do you need a Kleenex? Yeah. Could you pass me a Ziploc? We didn't realize we did it. So one day we're listening to this lecture and we're in this stuffy, overcrowded hall and it was like post-lunch. I mean, I was looking around, I really didn't think I was gonna be able to make it without passing out. And suddenly, my postulant sister leans over to me and she goes, I could really use some scotch. <laughs> say what? I was like, so could I, but I would never say that out loud. <laughs> I look over at her, she's holding her torn notebook in her hand, indicating to me that she could really use some scotch tape. I, I explained to her that that's one brand that you need to have the object attached. <laughs> Let's name a few things that keep us from receiving this gift of the new heart by name. First, fear. Fear has to do with punishment. It's a tactic of the enemy to make you think that you can't approach God because you will be judged, condemned, the brunt of anger and punishment. Jesus said to the woman caught in adultery, has anyone condemned you? Neither do I condemn you. There is no sin that God will not forgive. And believe me, priests have heard it all. When we go to confession, whatever we confess, 
is literally blotted out, wiped away. I'm not sure if you're familiar uh, with Margaret Mary Alacoque. She's the saint who Jesus revealed his sacred heart to. He also told her that he wanted her to have a spiritual director and that his name was Father Claude de Colombier. So she approached and asked Father Claude, telling him that Jesus had told her that he was to be her spiritual director. He was skeptical, to say the least. And he looked at her and he said, if Jesus appears to you again, you go ahead and ask him what was the last mortal sin that I confessed, then I'll know. She was like, okay. <laughs> so she agreed and returning later to Father Claude, she said, Jesus did appear to me again and I was able to ask him your question. And Father Claude goes, what do you say? <laughs> and she said, well, he said, I don't remember. He became her spiritual director. Yeah, so don't worry about it. Yeah. The second thing that keeps us from receiving the gift of the new heart, the lie, or lies. Whatever lies are being spoken. St. Augustine believed lies for years. And when he felt torn in breaking free of his sexual addiction, he heard temptation actually taunt him and pull him from behind saying, you can't live without us. But something told him, this is not true life. So as he was on the brink, opening himself up, he heard, take and read, take and read. And he opened up the scriptures to St. Paul. It said this, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual excess and lust, not in quarreling and jealousy. Rather, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the desires of the flesh. And he knew he wanted to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. What would have happened if St. Augustine had not crossed that bridge and left that sin behind? this man who became a bishop and a doctor of the church. The third thing, shame. Shame keeps us from receiving. Dr. Brene Brown is a shame researcher and she said this, you put shame in a Petri dish, it needs three ingredients to grow exponentially. Silence, secrecy, and judgment. You put the same amount of shame in another Petri dish and you douse it with empathy, it can't survive. Shame needs silence and secrecy to grow. The Lord in his goodness knew this. He gives us the sacrament of confession as a life-saving re life remedy for this death-dealing shame. Saint Ignatius, who gave us the 14 rules of discernment of spirits, which is how we can know if a movement within is from God or from the evil one. He says this in the 13th rule. The evil one acts like a seducer who says to us, don't tell anyone about that. This instills fear and keeps us in shame when bringing it to the light would set us free. Jennifer, one of the women that we served in our hope and healing mission, she had suffered two abortions in her young adult life. She shared the day that she received a major grace to be able to go to confession, and she had to apply this rule as she went. She'd made an appointment with her parish priest, and as she drove to get there, the battle was on. I wanna use her words. I'm clutching the steering wheel when suddenly I started hearing a whisper. You don't have to do this. What about the second abortion? You're not gonna tell him about that one, are you? You don't have to. Why are you making this so difficult on yourself? She said, I was fighting so hard through tears, crying and praying, Hail Mary. 
I was feeling so much conflict and terror because I could not get over that second abortion. Where is all this coming from? I lashed back and I said, no, I want to heal. Hail Mary, full of grace. I got there in tears and Father walked me through the whole confession. And at the end, he put his hands down and as if picking up a lamb and putting it on his shoulders said, all of heaven rejoices when the lost lamb is found. Welcome home. For the very first time in my life, I felt alive and in love. I will not leave you orphans. The final obstacle in our complete healing, Jesus came across and met a man who had been sitting 38 years by a healing pool. 38 years. He said to the man, do you want to be healed? That man did not answer yes or no. What he said to Jesus was, no one helps me. And when I try to go in myself, there's like obstacles in my path. Unforgiveness, blame, and delaying conversion. Unforgiveness. Unforgiveness is like me drinking poison and hoping someone else dies. Forgiveness is a gift I need to give in order to be able to receive it. Forgive and you will be forgiven. This can be hard. And the catechism actually affirms that it's hard and says, it's not in our power to forget an offense or to just stop feeling it. But the Holy Spirit works in the heart that asks for this grace. Who do you need to forgive? Come Holy Spirit, come and reveal that person. Free us from anger. Free us from the bitterness. I will give you a new heart and a new spirit. The third gift to be received is the kingdom come. Life in the Holy Spirit. A few years ago, Patty came into our lives. When her boyfriend found out she was pregnant, he gave her an ultimatum. You pick me or the baby. Crushed and betrayed, she chose the baby and she moved in with us. Now, although Patty was raised a Buddhist, she would come to our chapel for holy hour every day. She would look at Jesus and during this time, silently, he began healing her bruised memory, her crushed heart, speaking truths to her about her dignity, her beauty, his plan for love. Her son came two months early, premature, and fearful for his health, Patty asked that he be baptized a Catholic at the hospital. Named him Patrick Joseph. He was put into the neonatal intensive care unit and he was a fighter and live he did. And Patty thought, if this is what I wanted for him in his death, this is what I want for both of us in our life. And she entered RCIA classes one of the other guests living with us was so taken by Patty's joy. <laughs> One day she said, um, I would like to go to class with Patty too, okay? We're leaving. We're like, Bye! <laughs> Have so much fun at RCIA. <laughs> Later entered the church with her son Daniel. Now Patty's student visa was up and she had to make a last minute decision to stay and go to school or to move home and she chose to move home to Thailand. She told the priest who was preparing her, and he said, Patty, you are ready for baptism and for your first Holy Communion. So I was with her the night before when we were still trying to find her baptismal garment shopping. So I kinda wanna paint the picture for you. Manhattan, Macy's, Thanksgiving Day weekend, 9 p.m. 
So we run in, Sister Rita and Patty run one way, I have a three month old in arms, and I run the other way. I'm like, da 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 At this point in my young religious life, I hadn't been shopping in years, but I was still really excited. I was like, 66% off. So I'm holding the baby. I'm like rifling through the dress rack. And I don't know what I look like, a sister, in full habit, dress shopping with an infant <laughs> at night. The guy who worked there uh, timidly approached me and was like, sister, can I help you with anything? I was like, yeah. You can pray that we find the perfect baptismal dress for that young woman over there. And he was like, okay, yeah, yeah. He goes, something like this? And it was like, It was gorgeous. It, was per it had pearls all on it. Fit her like it was made for her. He picked out matching shoes, told her to get any accessories she wanted, and he rang us up at a very generous discount. That did not add up. It was like a dream. We never saw him again. But we never went to Macy's again at night, so I don't know. <laughs> <anyway. laughs> um, when we got home, Patty asked if we had a little chapel veil that she could wear. She said to me, sister, my heart is going like this. I feel like tomorrow is my wedding day. A wedding day. It was. God wed himself to her soul. And then Jesus gave his body and blood to her and Holy Communion. This is my body given for you, Patty. I will create a new heart in you and a new spirit that you may live. Heaven starts here by living in the spirit we have received that has been poured into our hearts. The spirit prays in us, teaches us, consoles us, and guides our decisions. The Lord does not ration his gift of the Spirit, but he never forces himself on us. He longs to be asked, invited freely. Ask and you shall receive. We took a woman that we were serving and her three-year-old son, Sael, to Mass for the first time. When Sael saw everyone begin to receive Holy Communion, he tugs at his mom and he goes, Mom! I want that. I need that. Mom, please. And his mom goes, no, Salito, you can't have it. <laughs> so sister reasons with him, tries to explain, Sayel, one day you'll be baptized and you'll receive Holy Communion. No consolation prize for this kid. Uncontrollable sobbing. I mean, forcible removal from the pew. It was bad. Later, one sister said to Sayel, wondering how his trip to church went, did you like going? It was God's house, but I cried. <laughs> and I just love when little kids tell on themselves, it's, it's the best. And sister played right into it because she could tell he really needed to get something off his chest. <laughs> she goes, oh no, Sayel, why did you cry? Well, because they had God's love and they wouldn't give it to me. <laughs> From the mouths of babes. <laughs> Jesus, who is love, knows that we are hungry for love and he makes himself our food. He comes to us individually, intimately, in a way that we can receive him. He knocks at the door of your heart. World Youth Day was held last summer in Poland and we helped at a catechetical site. And one night, Audrey Assad and Matt Marr were playing and Bishop Barron did the Eucharistic procession and there were like 18,000 young people in this arena, reaching out, crying, singing, praising. 
It was something out of the Gospels. The next day, I was talking to the, one of the young Polish security guards, Radek, and he said, Sister, last night, I was in the midst of all those people. I think I was the only sad one in the room. I just kept thinking, why not me? Then he said, how do you know God loves you? It flashed me back to a time when I felt the exact same way. My first retreat, Eucharistic adoration, I remember saying in my heart, wow, God, I don't know you like all these people know you, but I want to. I want to know you. For the first time, I sincerely opened my heart and I knew without knowing how that I was loved deeply. So I said, Radic, Jesus gave you this desire to fulfill it. Do you want to pray right now? And he did. And something got lost in translation because I went to go put my hand on his shoulder and he just put his hand up too and met mine <laughs> and closed his eyes. So now we're holding hands in the air. I thrive in awkwardness. So I gave him the squeeze, the release, shoulder. It was so moving because his desire was so great and I was moved to tears. We prayed. And I said, Radic, I know God loves you because I love you and I am weak and very limited. And he brought you into being so that he could share his life with you, so that he could be with you forever. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. Tonight is a night of healing. It's a night of mercy. And I know that there is someone in this room who knows the sadness. Not me. I'll always be empty. If that's you, Jesus is coming to you. Jesus is coming tonight. The same Jesus who was born as a baby in Bethlehem, the same Jesus who healed anyone who came to him with faith who died and rose to forgive sins, is here tonight. Let us ask the Blessed Mother, who received us as her own children at the foot of the cross, to take us by the hand. Take us by the hand so that we too can give God our yes. Yes, Father, to the life that you've given me. Yes, Jesus to the new heart that you won for me. Yes, Holy Spirit, live in me. He sees you, he knows you, he's coming to you. Open your hearts, receive the promise. Mm -hmm.